There we go. All right. Well, hey, I appreciate you and uh, and Cody for hopping on, man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How have you been? Doing good, man. How's everything going with you? Everything is going well. Nice, we're uh, we're working on a, a, a thing with a contractor where we have a little dispute on, on how many hours they spent on one of our units. But outside of that, uh, things things have been going really good. Nice, man. And I uh, I came across you guys actually through Cody on Bigger Pockets, And then nice. I reached out and saw you guys on YouTube. Uh, it looks mm. like you guys are, what, 60 plus units now? Uh, Cody's, Cody's at 81. He'll be at 87 and the next week. And then I'm at, uh, 67 units. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's great stuff right there. Yeah. We, we, uh, we keep busy. Yeah, man. And, uh, was this always the vision for you guys? Like I know you guys are a partnership now, but you know, how long ago did you get started in real estate? Um, I've been working in industry, I, I worked at CoStar for several years and I had like a, a rental condo. So, I mean, I was in industry since about six years ago, uh, started investing in multifamily December of 2020, met Cody in February of 2021. Um, he had, he recommended I buy a duplex across the street from one of his properties. I did buy that. And um, from that point, Cody and I started doing deals. I wanted to get to 30 units by 30 and I was 29. So um, we found a 38 plex that Cody had been looking at for a while. Uh, he just needed a partner to help him take it out. So took out a 38 plex, um, bought into one of his 12s. And then I, I found a seven. We negotiated for three duplexes and kind of just snowballed from there. Wow. And I imagine the financing, you guys get pretty creative, right? Financing, um, everything that Cody and I bought together has been seller financed. I've conventionally financed my first two duplexes. And I mean, technically my house. I mean, I have some conventional real estate, but for the most part, um, everything that Cody and I have been involved in together has been creatively financed, seller financing, and every deal has been totally unique. Wow, that is amazing. And for those who don't know what seller financing is, can you kind of touch on what that is and you know why that might be great for a new real estate investor? Yeah, absolutely. So with seller financing, it's going to essentially the seller's playing the bank. So, uh, and there's a few reasons they can do that. With the 38 unit, the reasoning was it, the property was just in really bad maintenance with terrible books. Um, a bank would not lend on that property. So their options were a cash buyer or they carry a contract on it. They tried to sell that on and off for the last 13 years. Uh, no one came in with that cash offer. So we were able to negotiate the seller financing there. The other reason and how the rest of our real estate worked is people will sell or finance when you have a relationship and you have trust. Um, some of the people we buy from, they have over 500 units paid off free and clear. They have, they have no debt. There's nothing we can really add to them monetarily. So it's not a numbers problem for them per se on that they are just they're bought into who cody and i are they want to be part of our story they essentially they they want us to carry the torch as they unwind their portfolio uh, we want to teach the next generation of investors how to find financial freedom in real estate and they want to help be part of that so they're seller financing because they trust us to execute they believe we can operate the properties and they're not going to have to take them back and they want to invest in us. So is that part of your strategy then? You guys are reaching out to people who have a large number of units free and clear and then building that trust and relationship with those people? Nope. I don't care if they have a bunch of units free and clear or how they bought their units. Uh, the way that we go about meeting owners and forming relationships is I call the people, everyone who owns uh, the type of multifamily real estate that I like owning and I just get to know them. I, I want to learn how they did what they did. It's more valuable to me learning that piece. So if we can get together with a few owners, um, let's go back all the way to the beginning where I had a duplex. Uh, I have a one duplex in Moses Lake, one over in Bremerton. When I'm calling, I'm calling people with 12 plexes. Hey, I started with a couple duplexes. I've figured out the bank financing. And I'm learning that to get to my goals, 
one duplex at a time is really capital intensive and really time intensive. You have a 12 plex, which is not something I figured out how to do. We're property neighbors. And I, I, I want to learn how you did what you did. Now, usually people's response to that will be, well, I'm not selling. And that's great because I'm not calling to buy. Uh, it, I can always call and try to find a deal. And I think everyone in our market's doing that. But if I learn how they bought it and I learn something new, I can apply that to the next hundred deals. And that's more valuable to me. And that's how we build relationships. Is, is I don't care if you're 80 years old and own everything debt free. I don't care if you're another 29 year old and you just levered up your whole portfolio. I want to learn how they bought it. And I want to have relationships with everyone buying the assets or holding the assets uh, that I do want to own at some point. And through that organically, I'll find something that they want and they'll find something I want. And as long as we all know each other, uh, the transaction just comes as a function of, you know, when they know me, they know my goals, they know Cody, they know his goals and they know the significance behind our goals. We're the obvious buyer for some of their stuff when they do want to sell and vice versa. If I'm getting rid of some of my little stuff, I know the people in town who really want to pick up duplexes and we can buy and sell that way. I don't need a lot of cold calls and it's, it's just a really simple organic way to do real estate. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it too, because personally I'm going after my first deal right now. Well, awesome. I'm going to have two or three deals this year. One would be a house hack. And mm -hmm. then I want to do two or three commercial properties, whether it's retail or multifamily, like what you guys are doing. And uh, I'm curious for me, there's a lot of follow-up. So what is your follow-up system like when building relationships with these property owners? Uh, oh, that's a great question. We actually, um, we're touching on that on our uh, YouTube channel this week. We, just, we I think we just posted the video on our, our whiteboard Wednesdays. We answer nice. five questions from people around the country who ask on our YouTube channel. And uh, that was one of the questions there is the, the follow-up. So the first call is not about buying property. It's about forming a relationship. Your second call is reinforcing that relationship. So typically I have a reason it's usually asking for a follow-up meeting um a, a real example i reached out to a husband and wife they happen to have about three four hundred units owned outright as well uh it was a phone call to their office got connected to their wife the the wife on the team um she connected me to her husband whose father is the one who built the portfolio so when i met i brought my wife we sat down we talked there's meeting one we just had a, a meet and greet. They let me borrow a wrench to fix a property I was working on down the street. Next time I came over, Cody was in town. So my follow-up there was, hey, I'm going to be in town again. I really appreciated our time with you last time. My business partner, Cody's with me and I'd love for you to meet him. Like it doesn't have to, once you have a relationship and you, it's not based on a transaction, I usually just choose a reason where I'm like, hey, I'm in your area again. I had a great time with you last time. I had a couple of ideas I want to run past you and we'll, we'll just talk real estate. I might bring a deal to the table that I'm working on and go, Hey, I, I know you did something similar to this. What are your thoughts on this deal? Um, that second meeting though, I'm again, not going to make it transactional. I'm not reaching out to, you know, Hey, it was really nice meeting you. Can I buy your stuff? Um, <laughs> as soon as it becomes that sure, they might sell me something. But what we found is you have a relationship with someone who has, like, let's take someone who has 500 units. If you called him about his duplex, you might never know he had those 500. And if you successfully found that deal and bought that duplex, you would never have had a shot at the whole rest of the portfolio. So I just want relationships with people. And um, yeah, that follow-up meeting, well, you're friends now. I mean, it's not too hard to find a reason to, to follow up with a friend. Come up with a question, introduce them to something new, bring some value to them, get coffee, call today. Yeah, man, that's a, that's a good way to look at it too, because I mean, in, in real estate, you know, I'm an agent, but mostly I'm looking to begin investing because as you very well know, that's where true wealth is built, mm -hmm. but it's all very salesy. There are very few people in there doing the relationship route. So yeah. it's not as common. Yeah. And, and, and Cody and I, we always compare to uh, there's red ocean and there's, there's blue ocean. There's where everyone is competing. And right now, the things that are really hot and popular are 
wholesaling and syndication. And I don't have anything inherently against the two things, but both of them are very, very marketing heavy and transactional. It is about finding deals and it's about volume. How many people can you call? How many doors can you knock? How much capital can you raise? On the flip side, relationship-based selling, I make probably two calls a week about real estate. And Cody does about the same. Uh, we'll say between the two of us, we'll round up. Let's say we make five calls. Wow. And we'll have three or four people call us. And so I'll book about a meeting a day. So I have a reason to go out to someone for lunch every day of the week. And after this, I know Cody has a dinner meeting. We did a breakfast with someone this morning. So I basically just eat with other people is, is how we prospect. I'm not talking about deals. So I'm not blowing up people's phone for, you know, are you looking to sell? Do you know how much your property is worth now? Um, while everyone competes over there, it's really easy going once you get your rhythm and you have a few relationships because you know, someone who, know, who has real estate, one thing we know that's true about owners, people who own real estate, know other people in real estate. So you meet a few people, they want to introduce you to a few more people. And it's just a real casual, honest way to do real estate and to transact. Now, if everyone shifted to our method, the people who are just grinding and cold calling are probably going to have a blast because they're now they're in blue ocean. But yeah, yeah. just the way the market's been stacked, that's something I learned working for CoStar and just being in the industry with all the brokers, owners, syndicators, managers. It's like, okay, everyone's kind of doing the same thing. Um, we stumbled on this by accident, but a few deals in, we, we learned, hey, we can, we can do this again and again and again. This is awesome. Let's do that. Yeah. So if you're making like, let's say a handful of calls per week, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Well, we have designated roles. So Cody is, Cody's a freak of nature. He's the best single salesperson I've ever met. And I, I've met a lot of them. He is especially gifted. Both of us can sell, but he's better bringing, we call it bringing in fish. And while I can sell, I'm really good at building the ship. I have a, one of my just things is I have a really great memory so I can keep track of where are all the bills going? What do we need to do with accounting? Um, who's the next hire we need to do? That structure just makes sense to me. We've structured it so we can each do each other's role. Cody can run the company and Cody can sell. I can sell and I can run the company. We like to make it so I am building the ship to store more fish and Cody is going out and getting more fish. And if we have those two roles going all the time, we can get a lot done. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean. But that's the day-to-day -to, -day to do that. We have a property management company. Hmm. We have um, our consulting company, Multifamily Strategy. That was my okay, shirt cool. here, uh, where we teach other people to do this and try to help other people break out of the nine to five. And then we go and buy a lot of real estate. So our day is very, very busy. Um, sometimes we have to run over to central Washington, about a two and a half hour drive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have a full 12 hour day if I'm just doing accounting and bookkeeping. Uh, days like today, I had two client meetings in the morning, one consulting call. Uh, we did some bookkeeping and we're doing loan applications. So it's, it's a lot of stuff, but I think the fun part for our day-to-day -day is it's not all about prospecting. I have a different thing to do every day of the week. While I work seven days a week, every day looks completely different than the other day, which is awesome. Nice, man. It's, it's really interesting to hear that you guys are branching out into consulting as well. Can you talk a little bit about the coaching and consulting has always been super interesting to me, especially in this digital market we're in now, how scalable it is. You know, how are you guys going about that in terms of building your consultant brand? For the consulting, there's a, there's a few things. So one of our early mentors said, Hey, you, you can't buy every good deal. And that's wrong. Um, you get creative and you can, Line capital, if it's a good deal, if it's truly a good deal, you can find a way to buy it. There's, a, there's enough money out there. There's enough creativity. There are so many ways to structure these. You really can buy all of them. But there gets a point, you get to a point where, well, I can buy every deal or I can help others. And 
helping others is really rewarding. There's other people who want to do this. And quite frankly, I don't want to manage trying to buy every property out there at once. Um, no way, we, no way we can do that. I'd be spread too thin. So it was just a natural evolution of how do we give back? Another thing that Cody and I have never seen online is I haven't seen people who start the, the mentorship and the, the YouTube journey from before they made it. And so with Cody and I, it's like, okay, I have not made it to my goal. Cody hasn't made it to his goal. We're right in the middle of our process. We've had a lot of early success. We've bought a lot of units, but I'm not some super guru. I'm not retired. Cody and I each, I mean, we have a seven figure net worth, but just by this much, we're not big multimillionaires. Neither of us drive Bugattis. It's, we're not going from, we're not looking back and saying, Hey, this is how we got here and we want to sell our experience. This is a, Hey, we want to do this with you. Come along for the ride with us. We're going to real time. We're figuring these things out. And if people want to learn how to get to where we've gotten and continue the journey with us, that's the type of team I want to build. And that's what mentorship looks like. Yeah. That's very interesting to hear you got to hear you say, because I think we're on the same frequency right now. It's, there are a lot of people like Grant Cardone, for example. Yeah these guys have made it right. And now they're coaching, but you're like, for example, you're on the path. I'm getting started on the path and uh, you want to take people along for the ride. So it's, you don't see that a lot. Like you mentioned. Yeah. I, when we were talking about uh, red ocean, blue ocean, I, I think this is a, a blue ocean concept for, for social media. There's not as much competition in the past. You had a lot of that. There was a big trend on YouTube of, Hey, I'm going to take the picture from the Ferrari and look how many books I read and, all the advertising is people walking through their giant house. Yeah. And those people made a lot of money because they were the first people to do that. And that's over. Like <laughs> Everyone has tried doing that now. Uh, I like sharing the hard things uh, with our mentees. I, I, I spent a lot of time talking about, this is what it looks like to get a homeless camp off your new property. It's super not easy. Um, in an area like uh, Seattle, it's some of the eviction rules are really, really hard, especially during COVID where people can just stop paying. What does that look like when you pick up a building where people are already not paying? Um, that's the type of stuff I want to share. And I don't see enough people coaching and advertising like this is hard and this is how you deal with it being hard. So yeah, that's, that's a lot of what we like to talk about. And that's what I try to cover in the mentorship is I'm like, look, you can you can learn how to do real estate math anywhere. You can learn motivation every, anywhere. We'll go over some of it, but I really just want to get down to what does it take to actually go out and just buy real estate? Let's remove steps. Let's not make it hard. Just if you want to be an investor, there's one way to do it. Buy investments. <laughs> and, and I want to just take the shortest path from point A to point B and help people get there. And how many, how many people are you guys currently mentoring? I think we currently have about 45. Oh, wow. 40, 40 to 45. I'd have to look at it uh, to get the exact number. But we have recently switched to small groups. Uh, we used to do one-on-one. -on -one, and what we found is we can reach less people one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one. It's both Cody and I. But with a small group, not only do we get to reach more people, but transactions started happening as soon as we moved people into groups of peers trying to do the same thing. They ask better questions. They motivate each other. People get excited. And that energy turns into deals. And it's created a really cool community and friendship, which is really fun to see, uh, especially in our younger crowd. I have a lot of 18 to 20-year-olds going through the program. It's fun to watch them connect, be part of text threads going back and forth where people just have a lot of fun. And so that, that's a, a model that we've switched to in the last several months. We've gone from individual to eight to 10 people groups. And we've had a lot of fun doing that. It's been really effective. Awesome. And for those who, I'm going to link your guys' YouTube channel and socials down below, but for those who are interested in the program, how can they find out more about it? Um, easiest way right now, um, I am building out our website and we eventually want to have both a pre-recorded version for people who can watch on just want to watch on their own time and then we'll have the group who wants to do it live so we're breaking that out right now 
until we get that live, the easiest way to reach us is just to hit me directly on Instagram. Uh, I have too many forms of social media. That's the one that I seem to be able to consistently check. So that's just at Christian Osgood. Um, definitely follow Cody on social media. I am the one who will be responding to you. So hit up mine if you're interested in mentorship or learning how Cody and I do this, uh, at Christian Osgood on Instagram. Message me there. It's the easiest way to find me. It's good to know. It's You mentioned something in there that's very interesting for me because mm -hmm. there are so many different social platforms to use. And you can become very uh, paralyzed by how much opportunity and options there are. Mm -hmm. So for me, like I try to focus very heavily on TikTok and on yep. you and on YouTube. So I'm curious, do you guys pick a couple or are you just putting it to all socials? I cannot get, and Cody has the same issue. I cannot get TikTok to take off. Um, I just feel like my dumbest content on there does the best. And that really annoys me. I love information and I am really passionate about good, solid information. Um, so you're just not going to see Cody and I posting dance videos, pointing at real estate sites. It's just not our thing. Yeah. Um, Instagram has been good. That gets good reactions. It's solid for my content and it's simple. So Instagram works for me. And then YouTube, in my opinion, is the best platform for mid length educational content and since we like introducing concepts uh in eight to 15 minute snippets youtube has been the best possible platform for me i love that page more than anything else we're doing on social everything else i just kind of have to push to the side because i don't have time to care about everything out there yeah so it's i'm in the same boat youtube is my favorite i mean i grew up on youtube university like i spend most of my time on YouTube, whether I'm making videos or I'm watching it. Mm -hmm. But like TikTok, for example, I had a video go viral and that helped tremendously. But all the content I make is for the purpose of bringing it back to YouTube. Because like you mentioned, that eight to 10 minute to 12 minute video is huge. And the most money is in YouTube. You know, there's not a ton of money in TikTok. That, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. There's not a ton of money. I mean, big TikTokers out there get a few million views on a video and they'll make like 500 bucks, something like that. Yeah. Social media strategy, the best, the best people at it, and I'm not the best person at it. So I'm not the one to, to tell you how to market. But I, I see people, if you're really good at your Instagram, TikTok funnel, you hit the most people there. And that is the value of, like if you're really good at TikTok, and I know a lot of people who are, you hit the top of that funnel. I think uh, Vena, if, if, I don't know if you've ever uh, seen her on TikTok. She has about half a million followers. Mm. So if you have a funnel like this of half a million people and you can funnel that to your YouTube where it's going to be more targeted, awesome. If you have a mentorship or some other end program that is very personal and individual, you're not going to get everyone from your top two there. So it's going to funnel down. That's kind of how I've stacked media of, of like, okay, I'm going to post Instagram, occasionally TikTok. I'm going to get stuff out there on the general platforms so that people watch our YouTube. The YouTube has great value. And if someone's like, hey, I really want to get coached, I have something for them. And my thought is if you design that type of funnel, you can hit pretty much everything. I need to be better at a lot of the platforms. I'm just, man, I just want to go out and buy real estate. I, I don't love, uh, yeah. I'm not a marketer. That's fair. And like you mentioned earlier, I noticed about myself too. I'm not the dancer. I'm not going to be like pointing to different things popping <laughs> up. It's not yeah. really my style, but what I've noticed is that if you keep it under 15 seconds, like the video, mm. it's tough to do that. But if you can keep it under 15 seconds, these videos can explode. I've never seen any social media with the most organic reach of TikTok. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. Uh, Everyone has told me that TikTok is the best way to get eyes. I haven't figured it out yet, but I have consistently been told by everyone in the space, TikTok is where you need to launch from. So good on you for doing that. Yeah, it's, it's a grind like anything else. <laughs> but I'm curious. I mean, social media is definitely going to be a big part of everyone's strategy. I'm sure mm -hmm. it's going to become a red ocean, as you've yep. you know, alluded to before. But what are your guys' goals, not only with social media, but number of units, your business, your net worth? What are you guys looking to do? 
we in the next few months will get over 100 units between Cody and I. Mm -hmm. um, my goal over the next couple of years is we want to pick up 200, maybe a little bit more total unit count. And then I am going to sell down the back 100 or so to completely pay off the first 100. That, okay. that slows growth, paying off debt, definitely slows expansion. But what it does is it gives us a base where it's, we own this, it's extremely hard to lose. With 100 units owned outright between two people, I can pretty much do whatever I want when I want with who I want. Um, I own my time and that's the mission that I have is, is I want to own my time. Personally, I, I want to become a, a dad in the next few years, um, which for my wife and I means adopting kids. Hmm. So for me to own my time and be able to provide for my family, I'm like, yeah, I I'm guaranteed to have that. If I pay off that front hundred, once we're there, I'm going to lever back up and expand to new property without re-leveraging the first stuff. I'm just going to creatively go out. And we're going to keep expanding from there and we will define that more, but, you know, pick up another thousand units in the future, but not before I secure my ownership of my time. Fair. And I got a couple of questions for you on that. It sounds Absolutely. like you're playing offense right now. Yep. And then you're going to kind of pull back, play great defense, set it up so you don't need to trade your time for money or do anything like that. And then ramp back up the offense. Is that kind of, Correct. That is exactly it. I don't love playing a lot of defense. I think it's necessary once you've built something you're not willing to lose. However, I haven't hit my goal yet. And I see a lot of people get stuck there where they get their first few rental properties and they get so stressed about, oh my gosh, what if I lose this? I need to, I need to play defense. If you're not at your goal yet, you have no right to stop. You, you need to keep pushing hit your goal. And once you're like, I cannot lose this, I've hit my goal. I'm there. Play some defense, lock that down and then figure out how you want to expand once you're locked down. Yeah. But, and, and for the selling of those hundred units, are you guys, either of you realtors or do you have a realtor you work with? How does that work? Cody and I are both licensed. Hmm. Um, I do not recommend people go out of their way to get licensed. I don't think it is a massive help to being an investor. Uh, if you want to be an investor, don't add steps. So if you want to invest, go buy investment real estate. If you want to be a broker or a, a real estate agent, then go get your license. But you're not going to learn how to be an investor by getting your license. So I want to say that here on this channel because yeah. a lot of people get stuck on that. I'll talk to people all the time. Well, I'm trying to get my, my license and then I'm going to go start investing. I'm like, why? If you want to invest, yeah. go invest. If you want to write contracts for other people, go do that. Um, for Cody and I, I needed a license for a company that I tried starting a couple of years ago that didn't quite get off the ground. Um, but it was a data product and it was easier to be a licensed real estate agent for that. Cody got his start right out of college. He became a real estate agent, learned the game, brokered a deal for a few clients in multifamily and started buying. Um, so we are agents. I don't recommend becoming one unless that is specifically what you want to do as a job. I can second that, my friend. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I'm a licensed agent myself, but I kind of forgot that I went into the business to become an investor. And then you become so laser focused mm -hmm. on, you know, brokering deals, finding clients, and you kind of forget why you went into it. But there's definitely no correlation between being a successful investor and having a license. That, yes. that's not a prerequisite. Yes. And you're not going to learn anything about how to write the contracts or how to analyze a property, get your broker's license. So anyone who thinks that out there, yeah. just know you're going to learn about riparian rights and whether a, a property is on moving water or still water. And it is going to have nothing to do with how to buy an investment property. You want to do that, find the right community, go out and meet owners, learn how they did it, find the right team, find the right mentor. But, um, Biggest thing that I, I drive home all the time, just don't add steps. If you're trying to get investment properties, just figure out how to buy the property. Yeah, that's a good point. So then the next question for you would be, 
Was there any period of analysis paralysis for you? When did you decide you wanted to buy a property? Then how much longer was it until you actually bought your first duplex in your case? Oh, that's a great question. So I started up, I love bigger pockets, huge fan. Um, I started with uh, Brandon Turner's book, the book on rental property investing. Loved the book. That was before I joined uh, lambs.com, which was, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to apply for Zillow. Zillow didn't accept me and lamb.com came up and they were based right next to my house. So like, oh, that's cool. That's real estate based. Talk about adding steps. I was like, oh, baby step. I'll advertise land. Now, now I'm in real estate. <laughs> CoStar Group bought that company. And so I worked for them for four years in various roles all over commercial real estate, working for banks, owners, brokers. I bought a little condo in there and converted it into a rental. I, I lived in it for a few years, fixed it up, and then made it a rental. And that's as far as I got. I was really, really, really slow starting. Uh, really slow. I got an analysis paralysis because I just wanted, I wanted to learn another book. I wanted to learn another type of investing. I wanted to learn another strategy. Go to another conference. Yeah. Whatever you add. I finally bought my first multifamily Let's see. So I started my adventure in 2016 with my first uh, condo. It was the end of 2020, December of 2020. I bought my first duplex. Mm -hmm. And once I bought it, I realized I wasted years trying to learn this. And all I had to do was just fill out the darn contract, make an offer and buy the property. Uh, within three months, I bought my second duplex. Within two months of that, I bought my first 38 unit. And within two months of that, I had bought three more duplexes, a sevenplex, and was under contract for a 12plex. So, I mean, it moves, you can move extremely fast um, if you don't add all the initial steps. I could have got there without, I don't know, without 90% of the books I read, without any of the conferences I got to, and... CoStar helped having a little bit of starting capital helped, but it didn't help me four years of lost time worth. I mean, it just, I did yeah. not get that much value. I could have just started buying something creatively. And that's why when I work with Cody, Cody's eight years younger than me has slightly more rental properties and we have the exact same net worth. Hmm. So if you get anything from that, do what Cody's doing. Don't, uh, <laughs> don't add a whole bunch of steps. Don't take a bunch of time. If you have analysis paralysis, it means you don't have the confidence to move forward. So you need to find someone who's done what you've done or what you're trying to do, excuse me. Yeah. And go do it. Yeah. Now there are so many good things to unpack there, but it seems just like human nature, whether it's with real estate or with fitness or investing, starting a business, whatever the case may be, we feel like we need to read that book. We need to reread that book. We need to go to that conference you know, there's so many more steps before we can actually take action. So yeah. for you, was there like a light switch moment or you just say like, you know, fuck it, I'm done. I need to take action type of thing. My light switch moment, um, honestly, for me, it was COVID. I really wanted to get, I thought I wanted to get into development. It was going to be the next thing that I did to get closer to buying real estate. Um, and COVID shut down. Every partner that I was working with to do that, they all went, hey, we don't know what's happening. I don't understand the economy. Uh, we're closing shop. And I just, that's, that's where I hit my threshold. I was like, I am not a work from home person. I don't want to wait around anymore. I'm going to go play the game. And that was exactly what my wife told me to do. Uh, I think those are the words she used. Hey, I am ready to play the game. What do we need to do to actually get pieces on the board? And I was like, well, I have to go buy some pieces. Let's, let's do this. And yeah. so I, I committed, I left, uh, I left CoStar, I went to a really, really small firm that focused on multifamily real estate. Cody was working there too. And uh, that's, that's, that's how I got connected with him and it's all history from there. For someone who's looking to get into multifamily or commercial, even residential investing, mm -hmm. but they still need that nine to five to keep their overhead and stay afloat. Do you recommend staying in the real estate industry, kind of how you did with the nine to five? That is a good question. 
I don't often get stumped. That is, that is a, that is a simple question that I should be able to answer. It completely depends on who you are. I have seen people who are extremely qualified for multifamily jump out of their nine to five too soon. And they're like, I'm now financially stressed. It's hard to make good real estate decisions when you need to buy a piece of real estate because you put all your eggs in the basket. Um, on the other hand, you have someone like Cody Davis. He had $3,000 to his name, basically no income and never had a W-2. He bought a 12 plex and that fixed some of that problem. He bought a second 12 plex and now he's doing even better. He bought a six plex. And so he was 21 years old with 30 units before him and I ever partnered on a deal. You don't need the nine to five to do this. It's all about how much stress you individually can handle and how committed you are to buying real estate. I was not committed enough before I was 28 to go all in on it. It would have been the wrong thing for me to do to leave my job because I, I just I would have taken too long to figure it out. I would have got stressed and it would have gone back. Yeah. If you're someone like Cody and you're just like, I'm going to do it. I'm young. I have no obligations to anyone. I'm going to make this happen. Okay, yeah. awesome. Jump out of your nine to five, make it happen. Um, it's, it's so individual to everyone. There's not a right answer, but know yourself is, I think where I've landed on all this rambling here is <laughs> if you know yourself and how much you can handle and what you want to do, I think your creativity is going to follow your level of commitment. Commit first, figure out the rest later. Yeah, no, that's definitely not rambling, but it was very insightful. And I think it, it reminded me of know thyself and win all battles. Yes. Yeah. You truly got to know yourself. For someone like me, I don't thrive under financial stress. Like I need some kind of income to like, so I don't get commission breath or think irrationally. Mm -hmm. Some people thrive under that. So it's yep. knowing yourself truly. Yeah. But whether it's in or out of industry, I, I don't think that piece matters as much. It's not too hard to figure. It's, it Real estate is not rocket science. You, you need to be a good landlord. You are giving housing to people. You're providing that as a service. Make your places somewhere that you'd be willing to live. Um, okay, simple enough. Figure out how to buy real estate. Turns out we've been buying real estate since almost the dawn of man time. I mean, it, yeah. since, since we have been in existence, we have bought and sold real estate. So it's figure outable. Everyone has, has done it, will do it. It's part of life. So that's not too hard to figure out. And the math isn't that complicated. You need to buy on cash flow so that you don't lose the property. And if you don't lose the property, you don't care if it's an up cycle, down cycle, wherever the market's at, as long as you can keep your property you'll make money in real estate. It's not that hard to learn. You don't need to be in the industry to figure out how to do it. You just need to be around the right people. So yeah. if you have a nine to five and you love it and your job is working for Amazon, your mission is surround yourself by the right people who know what they're doing, who can help you get started. Yeah. Well, I don't know how many people at Amazon actually love their job, but, but we digress from there. Um, you know, I've asked you a lot about real estate, but yeah. what, do you, what do you do outside of real estate? You know, what are some of your other passions that you work on? I am working on having other passions. Um, I have, I've hyper obsessed on real estate and that's how we've moved as fast as we have um, to go from four units to 67 units. I work 12, 14 hours a day, six, sometimes seven days a week. I mean, I, I'm always on. Um, I have a bunch of guitars. I enjoy playing music. Uh, I'm trying to learn fly fishing. I've allocated an wow. hour every Saturday to trying to learn how to fly fish. Um, but right now I am 100% focused on the ownership of my time. I, I want to own my time and to pull that off. I have enough moving at the same time where I'm just, I want to grow my companies. I want to stabilize my companies. I want to finish renovations on the real estate projects that we've started. And um, I can tell you today, I don't do anything else with my time. Uh, in a few years, when I own my time, I'm going to play a lot more music. And I'm fairly likely to move to Texas where it's warmer and the food's better. 
Cheers, my friend. I moved from New Jersey here to Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, for, there we go. Yeah. I mean, it's February. I have a burn right now. I was tanning earlier today. <laughs> uh, it's New Jersey could never do that, you know? Yeah, it's it's uh, I think it's about 25 degrees here in Seattle this week. It's it's a cold week for us. Yeah. But it's gray. It's cold. And I mean, there's stuff that's good and bad about every place. I mean, it, you get bullshit anywhere. Sure. Um, just, I just turned 30. I am just, I'm ready for a different set of bullshit. Texas has the, has the bullshit I wanted to deal with right now. So I'll head down there and we'll, we'll see where we go from there. But, uh, yeah, right now, this is all I do in a few years. I get a lot more freedom to do what I want. Nice, man. Are you thinking Austin, Texas? I am thinking, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. Okay. Specifically a little North of Fort Worth. There's a town called grapevine um a few little towns around it flower mound keller um beautiful beautiful area nice people lots of development and not quite as expensive as austin yes yeah. it will be but not yet yeah yeah dallas fort worth is a very interesting market i follow a couple of realtors out there on instagram and the properties are beautiful but they're still priced under 500k a lot of them so it's definitely going to be growing yeah I, I absolutely think it will. Yeah, man. All right, cool. Well, hey, before we wrap up here, I just want to wrap up with a couple couple questions for you. Absolutely. You know, obviously, you've grown incredibly quickly. You know, what are some of the books or routines that you have on a daily basis? Like, what are you currently reading? Um, and what is your morning routine like, you know? Every morning, my schedule is, my schedule is different enough. I am not there are people who just thrive on routines. I am not a routine person. Um, I got sick of that in the nine to five. That's part of my reason for getting out. I will wake up whatever time I need to wake up to get my work done. Sometimes we have stuff in central Washington where I'm like, I have to be up at three 45. I'm going to get home at midnight the next day. And we're just going to do it. Cause that is what I have to do. Um, there's other days where I'll sleep in all the way till eight, hop out of bed, make myself a breakfast and I'll work till six or seven in the afternoon, just getting through what we need to do. Uh, so routine, it's just kind of whatever, whatever needs to be done will be done at all costs. Um, I don't know if that's healthy or not, but that's, that's the reality of what I do. As far as books, the best book I've ever read is Cardone's 10X Rule. Mindset is everything. That is my favorite book on mindset. Love, love them or hate them. Um, his content is right on it's it's stellar it's just you have a duty to go out and succeed to the potential that you have whatever you've been blessed with you have to go and chase that and i wake up every day with that mentality that's how we operate when stuff gets hard doesn't matter we're getting it done um if you're looking to get into real estate investing, uh, the first book I read is still one of my favorites, Brandon Turner's The Book on Real Estate uh, Investing. It's a great book. It just gives you a general feel for here's all the pieces. It's not too deep on anything. It's deep enough. It has real examples. Uh, I love that book. If you want to get better at communication and sales, I would say Jordan Belfort, uh, Way of the Wolf, Straight Line Selling yeah stellar stellar book i reference it all the time um boy i've been told not to give over three examples but uh chris voss has a book never split the difference on negotiation mm. that is a very solid book between those four those have probably been the most useful books to my career and personal development any of those are a great read for literally anyone I've heard a lot about never split the difference. I have not yet read it though. So it's, I think it's on my, I bought it, but I have not yet read it. It's definitely on the list. Chris Voss also has a very cool voice. If you can get it in audio book, it is, it is worth listening to. He has, a, he has some tonality in there that I also use. He doesn't talk about it, but just the way he speaks is, it's an added dimension to the book that I, that I recommend. If you can get any of those on audiobook, especially the ones about mindset and sales, the way Cardone, Voss, Belfort speak is also worth noting. Have them in hard copy, listen to them in your car. 
uh, you will get value from doing it both ways. Okay. And next question for you would be, if you were to talk to your past self with zero units or just getting started, because a lot of people, myself included, are in that position, mm -hmm. what would you say to kind of push yourself in the right direction and knowing what you know now? Stop adding steps. That is the simplest, easiest thing that I can tell anyone. That is where almost everyone gets stuck. You need to chart out and map out what are the things that I know that I know? Like, what am I sold on? What do I have a mastery of in real estate? And what do I know that I don't know that I need to, to get there? If you can map that out and move things from this box to this box, it makes it very simple. You're going to get it down to a point where it's, okay, I have enough mastery here to have confidence. With confidence, you can commit. With commitment, you can get creative and you're going to hit your goals. But don't get stuck on the, hey, I just need to learn, 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 learn. <laughs> Yes. Map it out. What do I need to know to get started? What is my minimum that I need? What should I have? I'm going to keep learning, but what do I need to get started? I'm going to learn it and I'm going to start buying real estate. Yeah, man. And earlier you mentioned, is there a deadline on that finishing the offensive stage, setting that defense and then going? Oh, yes. Or... Oh, yes. Every time you set a goal, it has to have a timeline. Otherwise, it's just another thing that will never happen. Um, it's not a goal without a timeline. It's, then it, it's, it's just a dream. Um, for the acquisition and selling off of units, we want to do that within the next 24 months. 24 months. Okay. I want to have 100 units owned free and clear two years from now. With, partnered with Cody. So, I mean, I'll own 50% of them. So, it will be like having 50 of my own units. But it's more fun with friends. We're not going to get into partnership today because that's a whole nother topic, but yeah. if you have someone you trust and you have a buddy to do this with, I, I find it's a lot more fun. hundred units paid off between the two of us. We can take out a lot and that's, yeah. um, that's our next step. I actually watched one of your guys' videos on, uh, I think that was the first one that popped up for me. Oh, really? Your guys' channel, the how to structure or how to set up partnerships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was very good. I'll definitely link that below as well as your guys' channel. But for anyone else, you know, who wants to check more about you guys out, what would you recommend? Instagram, your website, what's the best place to find you guys at? Best place to find us and know what we're all about is our YouTube channel. It's Cody and Christian Multifamily Strategy. I apologize, it's a mouthful. Um, oh. But if you follow us there, we do, we post three times a week. Um, we'll usually do something conceptual on Mondays. So it'll just be like you saw partnership. Um, or how we did our first deal, how to do the math. You'll see some concept on Mondays. Wednesdays are really fun. We answer five questions on our channel. It's called Whiteboard Wednesdays. Uh, we just did our seventh one, and I finally bought a whiteboard for Whiteboard Wednesday. Nice. Uh, but as we go through it, we just go through the chat. We chose five questions, and we answer those questions every week. It's my favorite series we do. And typically, Friday is either going to be a conceptual thing, or we'll do a real-life example from a mentorship call. Um, so that will be a specific, like how we find owners. I'll hop on a zoom and I'll actually go through step-by-step step. here is functionally how you identify what corporation owns this building. How do you find who owns the corporation? How do you find their phone number without paying money or skip tracing? One of Cody and my things that people give us flack for all the time is I don't use any software for that. I prospect on Google maps. I find numbers through Google search. Um, Everything I do is free. Everything we do is simple. We'll show stuff like that on Fridays. But if you want to follow us anywhere, uh, watch our YouTube channel. We answer every question on there. And I think that's the best way to get to know how we do what we do. Yeah. Well, hey, honestly, what I'm learning so far in entrepreneurship is that complexity is the enemy of progress. It's got to yes. be simple. So yep. it's, it's good to hear you guys are doing that as well. Absolutely. If you have too much going on, you will implode. Yeah. Parallax of choice, I think it's called. Yes. It yeah. is just way too much. You don't want a whole bunch of moving targets. The less pieces you can build, whatever you're trying to build with, identify your goal and then figure out what is our most efficient way there. And just don't deviate from it. Yes, sir. Well, hey, I do appreciate you hopping on. I truly enjoyed this conversation. Learned a lot from you. And uh, I'll be sure to let you know where you can find this podcast and uh, definitely go from there. Perfect. Thanks so much for having me on. I had a blast anything we can do for you. 
uh, let me know and uh, we'll talk soon. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. Have a good one.